Michael Porcella was a lawyer who moved into a one-bedroom cottage on Laguna Avenue in Oakland in 2007. The cottage was directly behind a two-bedroom home occupied by Linnell and Ian Lacey. The Lacey's home and Porcella's cottage were close together with a walkway separating the two dwellings. The Lacey's first met Rennie in July 2008 when Porcella brought her to the cottage. This is the true crime story of Rennie Pratt. Rennie, a hairstylist, was Porcella's girlfriend and had three children from a previous relationship. Rennie moved into the cottage with Porcella in the fall of 2008. The Lacey's heard Porcella and Rennie arguing the first day they met her. From about January 2009 onwards, there were arguments that could be heard by the Lacey's about every two weeks. On one occasion, in January 2009, the Lacey's were woken up by shouting. They hoped that Rennie would move out because of the series of disturbances involving Porcella and Rennie. And you can see they were in quite a tumultuous relationship. The Lacey's usually heard Porcella trying to calm Rennie down during the arguments. On December the 27th, 2008, Oakland police responded to a call of a woman screaming at Porcella's cottage in Oakland. The officers who responded saw no sign of visible injuries on either Porcella or Rennie. Porcella's mother, Karen Porcella, described an incident that occurred on February the 28th, 2009, in which three couples, including her son and Rennie, were invited to their home in Walnut Creek. Rennie arrived at the home around 9 p.m. after everyone else was seated for dinner. Rennie drank a lot of wine at dinner. At one point, Mrs. Porcella heard a shouting from outside after Porcella and Rennie had left the table. She went outside and saw Rennie's car in the middle of the street with the door open. As Rennie sat in the car crying, Porcella told his mother to take the keys because Rennie should not be driving. Mrs. Porcella took the keys and parked the car. She escorted Rennie to a small room off the garage and checked on her several times. After Porcella and the other guests left, Mrs. Porcella brought Rennie into the house and talked with Porcella's father. Rennie told them that she loved Porcella very much and that she wanted to marry him, although she complained that Porcella had hit her car. Mrs. Porcella noticed a ding in the hood of the car that looked as though somebody had hit it with a fist. Mrs. Porcella described another incident that took place on March the 4th, 2009. She had received a telephone call from her son around 6 p.m. saying that he needed his parents' help. When the parents arrived at Porcella's cottage, Rennie was on the porch smoking and drinking. Upon seeing Porcella's parents, Rennie went into the house where two of her children were seated at a table. Rennie started ranting and complaining that Porcella had called her the B word and the C word. Or in other words, see you next Tuesday. She also complained that Porcella had made her move to Oakland by a car and leave her home. Mrs. Porcella offered to put Rennie up at a hotel or have her stay with her and her husband. But Rennie refused and said she was staying at the cottage. When Porcella arrived and entered the bedroom, the children called him Daddy. Rennie told her children, don't call him Daddy, he's not your father. That's kind of cold, huh? After Mrs. Porcella instinctively placed her hand on Rennie during the conversation, Rennie told Mrs. Porcella to take her hands off and added, now I see where he gets it from. Porcella pushed Rennie up against the wall and took her phone after Rennie threatened to call the police. As Rennie screamed, Porcella handed the phone to his mother. When his mother offered to call the police, Porcella said she had better give Rennie back her phone because he thought that taking it was illegal. Mrs. Porcella returned the phone to Rennie. As Rennie and the children were leaving, Mrs. Porcella called the police. When the police arrived, Mrs. Porcella told the officer that Rennie was out of control and perhaps should be committed under section 5150 because she was a danger to herself or others. The officer stated that they could not remove Rennie because she had established residence at the cottage. An officer suggested a restraining order. The police ultimately told Porcella's parents 
that they had to leave. The parents left and met their son at their house in Walnut Creek. The following day, Porcella printed out forms for a restraining order and began to fill them out. On the way to the courthouse to file the forms, Porcella changed his mind about seeking a restraining order. He told his mother, Mom, I want to think about it for 48 hours. A neighbor of Paul Sellers testified that on the evening on April 10th, 2009, shortly after 11 p.m., she saw Paul Seller driving up quickly toward the cottage. The neighbor, who lived in the house immediately in front of Paul Seller's cottage, Mrs. Lacey, testified that she was at home with her husband and a friend on April the 10th, 2009. At around 11.30 p.m., she was in the back bathroom of the house, flossing and brushing her teeth. The distance from the Lacey's bathroom window to the Porcella's cottage was about 12 feet. Mrs. Lacey described her nighttime routine as flossing her teeth, followed by brushing with an electric toothbrush for a two-minute cycle, ending with rinsing her mouth for 60 seconds with a fluoride rinse. This timing was relevant because Mrs. Lacey first heard footsteps on the stairs to Porcella's porch while she was either flossing or brushing her teeth. She next heard Porcella's and Rennie's voice while she was brushing her teeth. The voices were low, and although she could not make out individual words, it sounded a little bit contentious. Mrs. Lacey then heard more footsteps on the stairs, followed by Porcella saying clearly, get out, twice. Porcella said the words, in a normal, clear speaking voice with no trace of emotion. At that point, Mrs. Lacey was rinsing her mouth. She then heard a loud pop. According to Mrs. Lacey, Rennie said something like, Oh my God, and started calling Porcella's name, sounding extremely distressed. Mr. Lacey testified that he was studying in his back room at around 11.30 p.m. on April the 10th, 2009. He heard Rennie's voice but could not make out any of the words. He then heard Porcella's voice which he described as a little louder. According to Mr. Lacey, Porcella said get out twice and then said put that down. Mr. Lacey then heard a pop. After the pop, there was a silence for about 5 to 30 seconds. Mr. Lacey then heard Rennie's voice beginning to wail and say oh my god. Mr. and Mrs. Lacey ran to the kitchen. Mrs. Lacey heard Rennie's voice becoming louder and softer as if she were moving in and out of the cottage. Mrs. Lacey called 911. Oakland police officer Michael Morris responded to the 911 call and arrived at the scene at about 11.30 p.m. Two other officers were already there. Officer Morris saw Paul Seller lying on the front steps of the cottage with papers next to him. Rennie was leaning over Paul Seller with both of her hands covered in blood. She told Officer Morris that Porcella was still breathing. Officers detained Rennie and took her to a patrol car. An officer who responded to the scene stated that it appeared that Rennie had been drinking although she did not smell of alcohol. Rennie's blood alcohol level was 0% at 5.20 a.m. the following morning. A neighbor and a police officer attempted first aid on Porcella before the Oakland Fire Department arrived to continue efforts to save him. Porcella was pronounced dead at the scene. Porcella died of a gunshot wound. The doctor who performed the autopsy testified that the bullet entered the victim's head through the right eyelid close to the nose. The bullet traveled on a 45 degree angle downward towards the victim's feet then traveled through his spinal cord and lodged in the back of his neck. The damage to the spinal cord would have caused paralysis, which would have caused Porcella to collapse. There were no powder burns on the victim. The bullet would have caused death within three to five minutes. Porcella displayed scrapes and bruises consistent with falling after being shot. Tests of Porcella's blood revealed that his blood alcohol level was 0.11%. There was cocaine metabolite in his blood, indicating use of cocaine between 8 and 24 hours previously. Officer Morris performed a protective sweep and observed numerous items of evidence, some of which were later seized by a police department technician. A pistol was located on a couch about 8 to 10 feet from the front door of the cottage. The pistol 
was a Republican Arms .45 caliber Patriot model semi-automatic handgun. It was determined that the Patriot handgun fired the fatal shot. Near the Patriot handgun on the floor was a slide lock pin which had fallen out of the gun. Officer Morris picked up the Patriot handgun in order to render it safe but found that the slide was jammed. Officer Morris observed that an expended casing was still in the gun's firing chamber and one live round was still in the magazine. Three other guns were found in the cottage. A Glock handgun and a box of ammunition were found on the top shelf of the closet. A Ruger rifle with no round in its firing chamber but three rounds in an attached magazine was found leaning up against the wall of the closet. Finally, a shotgun was found lying on the bedroom floor with its barrel facing the cottage's front door. The shotgun was not loaded. A live .45 caliber bullet was found on the kitchen counter. The round may have been cycled through the Patriot handgun that was found on the couch. One live 9mm round was found on the laundry room floor and two additional 9mm rounds were found on the kitchen floor. Officers observed a bullet hole through the frame of the metal green door at the front doorway to the cottage. The hole was a little over 56 inches above the bottom of the door, a slight one degree upward angle from inside of the cottage to the outside. Police officers seized two laptop computers and recovered a cell phone from Porcella. An investigator testified that she observed about three and a half thousand photos that had been stored on the computer's cell phone and other digital devices. About 30 of the photographs depicted Porcella with guns. Six of the photographs showed injuries to Porcella. None of the photos showed injuries to Rennie. An Oakland Police Department criminalist who testified as an expert in firearms described how the Patriot handgun operated. Ordinarily, pulling the trigger would cause a bullet to fire, ejecting the expended casing and reloading a live bullet from the magazine into the chamber. However, the Patriot handgun recovered from the crime scene had a defective slide lock pin which could easily fall out if the gun were held in the wrong position. When the slide lock pin was missing, the slide was restricted in its movement and the fired casing remained in the chamber. A new live round would be prevented from being pushed into the firing chamber. When the slide lock pin was in place, the gun would fire normally. The slide lock pin was not in place and the expended casing was stuck in the fire chamber when the Patriot handgun was recovered. The trigger pull on the Patriot handgun was 14 pounds. A common trigger pull is 8 to 10 pounds. The criminalist testified that the gun could not discharge without the trigger being pulled. Now at trial, Mrs. Porcella recalled that her son had gotten a Glock handgun when he was around 18 years old. She also knew that Porcella had his grandfather's shotgun, which she once saw in the closet at the Oakland cottage. That was the only time she saw a gun at the cottage. Porcella's father testified that he had helped his son move into the cottage and saw no guns at the time. Although he knew that his son had the Glock handgun and his grandfather's shotgun, Mr. Lacey, Porcella's neighbor, testified that he had never seen gun in Porcella's cottage in the roughly five times he had been inside. It was stipulated at trial that Mr. Lacey told an officer at the scene immediately after the shooting that he had heard Rennie and Porcella talking and then heard Porcella say, get out at least twice. Now Rennie also testified in her own defense at trial. She had three children with Louis Garcia, although she had split up with Garcia years before meeting Porcella. She met Porcella in May of 2008. They moved in together at the end of October 2008. According to Rennie, Porcella loved guns and threatened to use them on a number of occasions. One time, before Rennie moved in with Porcella, he had showed her a gun in a car. Another time, Porcella pulled a gun while involved in an argument with a cousin. On another occasion, Porcella had threatened to shoot Garcia, the father of Rennie's children, if he came over to their house. Rennie saw Porcella carrying the Patriot handgun many times, either in his backpack or in the trunk of his car. After the fight with his cousin, Porcella complained that Rennie had not helped him and put a gun to her head. Many other times, he would put a gun to her head to get her to shut up. Once he put her hand on a gun and told her to shoot 
Rennie claimed to have never handled a gun before meeting Porcella. Rennie testified that Porcella was a jealous person and accused her of having sex with Garcia. According to Rennie, Porcella made her feel worthless and would put her down and call her names. Porcella also threatened to have her committed under welfare and institution code section 5150 as a threat to herself or others. She felt that their use of marijuana and cocaine was horrible and testified that drug use would make Porcella irritable. Rennie also claimed that Porcella was physically violent with her. She was afraid of him before they even moved in together. On the first occasion involving physical violence, he grabbed her by the back of the neck, choked her and asked if she wanted some more. She claimed he pulled her hair and choked her about every two weeks. In response, she would scratch his face and raise her voice. On one occasion, when Rennie threatened to call the police, Porcella took pictures of the scratches on his face and said he would show them to the police and have Rennie put in jail. She never reported anything because she was concerned that Porcella might lose his law license and she feared that he would kill her. On December the 27th, 2008, Rennie and Porcella had plans to go to a wedding but Porcella did not want to go. He struck her and after Rennie began screaming wildly for help, choked her and told her to shut up. The police came and Porcella told her to tell them that no violence had occurred. She did not tell on Porcella because she did not want him taken to the police. Rennie testified about the time she went with Porcella to his parents' house for dinner. She and Porcella had an argument before arriving at the house and later when Rennie left the parents' house. Porcella jumped on the hood of her car and dented it. Mrs. Porcella came out when Rennie screamed. That night, Rennie told Mrs. Porcella that her son had been aggressive with her, to which Mrs. Porcella replied, Oh dear. In early March 2009, Porcella was angry with Rennie and said he would call his parents. When their parents arrived at the cottage, Rennie finished cooking soup for her children. Mrs. Porcella told Rennie that her son wanted her to pack up and leave. At the time, Rennie told Mrs. Porcella that her son had been putting his hands on her, had almost killed her and had a drug problem. Porcella took Rennie's phone and slammed her against the wall after she threatened to call the police. Following the incident, Rennie was ready to move out but made up with Porcella, who sounded like he meant it when he told her that they were going to work things out. At the end of March 2009, Rennie packed a suitcase and went to the house of a male friend. She found a new apartment and got the keys to it on April the 9th, which was her birthday. On the day of her birthday, she had not seen Porcella for almost a week. Porcella contacted her during the day and that evening they went out to dinner. Following dinner, they went to a club where they ingested cocaine. Back in the car, Porcella slammed Rennie's head against the dashboard because he thought Rennie had been flirting with his friend that evening. After returning home to the cottage, Porcella pulled her hair and put a gun to her head after she began screaming saying he would kill her if she did not stop screaming. The following morning, on April 10th, 2009, Porcella did not allow Rennie to leave to go to work. He slammed her back onto the bed and choked her. She finally left the cottage around 4pm but agreed to attend an Oakland A's baseball game with Porcella that evening. She was not really sure that she wanted to go to the game with him but agreed to go after he showed up at her new apartment. Before the game, Rennie drank four beers and smoked marijuana. She and Porcella argued throughout the game about her moving out of the cottage. Rennie refused to leave the game with Porcella but she had no money. She ultimately got a ride to the cottage from a stranger. She claimed that she wanted to go back to the cottage because she had left things in Porcella's trunk. She also realized she had locked her own keys in her car and wanted to get a spare set of keys from the cottage. Upon arriving at the cottage, Rennie called Porcella and told him she needed to retrieve items from his car. Porcella responded by calling her a vulgar name and telling her he was going to shoot her. Rennie knew that Porcella was at a friend's house only a block and a half away. Porcella texted, be there in 10. When Rennie walked into the cottage, she saw a gun on the floor. She saw the Patriot handgun when she went into the bedroom 
to retrieve her spare car keys. She was frightened and picked up the gun to unload it because she thought Porcella might use it to shoot her. She also took some of the bullets she saw and walked to the kitchen to throw them in the trash but then dropped them on the floor instead. She was texting Porcella throughout this period. The last text message she sent read, Yeah, thought so, cheat. Rennie testified about how she had attempted to unload the Patriot handgun. She stated that she had pulled the slide back and picked a bullet out of the chamber with her left index finger. After putting that bullet down, she then moved the slide back again and looked for another bullet, but the slide kept jamming. Rennie claimed that during the time she was trying to unload the gun, she did not see Paul Seller standing on the porch or hear his voice. And then the gun went off. Court noted that Rennie demonstrated the gun's barrel was tilted slightly upward at the moment, such that the front of the gun was about half an inch above the knuckles as she was holding it on the grip. Rennie put the gun down on the couch. According to Rennie, she then went outside where for the first time, she saw Porcella lying on the ground. She called out his name and said, Oh my God. She picked him up and saw there was blood on his eye and her hand. She claimed that she tried to call 911 without success. Her phone began calling Porcella's phone instead of calling 911. She put her hand in Porcella's pocket and retrieved his cell phone as well as his car keys. She testified at trial that she did not intend to shoot the gun or shoot at Porcella. Rennie conceded that in the numerous texts she had exchanged with Porcella, she often complained about the relationship. The texts contained complaints about physical violence, jealousy and name calling. Rennie acknowledged instances in which she had felt jealousy over Porcella. She testified about an incident in February 2009 in which she had texted Garcia that she had taken 14 to 18 pills after learning that her stepfather had assaulted her sister. Garcia texted Porcella to check on Rennie. Porcella later texted Rennie that he could not be with someone who was so impulsive. Rennie also discussed a series of texts in which Porcella stated that he wanted her to get her own place. Rennie's former co-worker testified at trial that she had seen bruises on Rennie's arms and neck on more than one occasion. The co-worker had also seen Rennie wearing massive amounts of makeup on her neck. Rennie's former employer testified that he had helped Rennie, mother, look for Rennie's car after her arrest. The car was locked and the keys to the car were found in the centre console. So, at the end of the trial, on the June 24th, 2011, Rennie was sentenced to 21 years in prison. And I think in this story, you have a clear case of just a dysfunctional, tumultuous relationship. Neither one of them respected each other. Both of them were pissed off with one another. Neither one of them could leave. Maybe they would have felt alone. Either way, Porcella died in tragic fashion. And today, the real victims are the kids who are left with their mother in jail. Comment, tell me what you think.